So this is well, they call it the boring billion, but it's more than one billion. It's a, there's some number of billions of years where apparently nothing happened. Is this a science fight? Do you think it's boring? That billion years. The pro, what we call the Proterozoic for people who know these names. But anyway, about two point yeah. five to about. I'm currently years. creating a list of people who think that it's a boring billion. <laughs> they have something. And their number is. <laughs> their days are numbered. Number. Congratulations, number thirteen. <laughs> 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 Hello and welcome to Wonder, brought to you by GeoCo. I'm Holly Cook. I'm joined as always by my colleague, Dr. Anthony Reid. And today we're joined by Dr. Indrani, middle Proterozoic Mukherjee. <laughs> we have some brilliant conversations about a fairly big moment in Earth history, sometimes called the boring billion. We're talking today about why it's not so boring after all. Hey, Indrani, great to have you here. Thanks for thanks for joining us. I Listen, I'm really confused in a way because this is supposed to be, often on our podcast, we're talking about rocks. We're talking about geology. We're talking about rocks. But one of your amazing specialties and research specialties is actually the chemistry of the ocean. So just can you give us an idea of what's the relationship between the ocean and rocks? Yes, the relationship is actually quite a fascinating one. The If you go to our depths of the oceans today, we'll find the ocean floor and sediments being slowly and quietly deposited Mm. over millions and millions of years. Now, that sediment interacts with the overlying seawater for millions of years. And in that process, it records the chemical conditions of that environment very well. And that sediment itself, you know, further lithifies into mud rock and um, it further lithifies into um, harder rock stones Mm. and then it basically gets uplifted. And uh, as geologists, we target specific rocks that were once deposited in the depths of our oceans. In the oceans, yeah. That interaction between the seawater and sediment that is lays the foundation for for what the chemistry of the rocks so is in, capturing. Yeah, so it's in the chemistry that these things are related, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So a rock obviously is composed of several minerals. I mean, it. It is quite possible in the geochemical world that you look at the the whole rock or you could target specific minerals within those rocks mm. because they capture different information yeah, yeah, about yeah. the ocean conditions. So is the ocean, the, the, the present day ocean, if you go to the north of the Pacific or you go to, I don't know, somewhere off the south, somewhere off Antarctica and you look at the chemistry of that ocean water, are they going to be the same or different? No, it it is not the same at any given time. There is a lot of heterogeneity in wow. our oceans today. However, if you if you look at the chemistry of our oceans over a over a really broad first order scale, so we're looking at changes not from Monday to Friday, but right. we're looking f- across millions or sometimes billions of years. Then y- you could come up with an idea of what the the chemistry has been in the oceans overall. For instance, the salinity of our oceans uh, is roughly the same, but if you, you know, it, it won't be exactly the same, but overall y- you could say that it's um, like almost the present the same. day ocean. Yes. So are there some elements which are more sensitive to ocean conditions Absolutely. or something like that? Yeah. So because the conditions of the atmosphere, so I know we think of the ocean as a separate, so the hydrosphere is separate mm-hmm. to the atmosphere and to the biosphere and the geosphere. In actual fact, everything is connected. So a lot of what is currently available in our oceans depends on the chemistry of the atmosphere. So mm-hmm. you thought the ocean chemistry and rock is fascinating, that relationship, but there's a very strong link between the atmosphere chemistry and the ocean chemistry. And I say that because today's atmosphere is very oxygenated. And that helps or facilitates with oxidative weathering. Mm -hmm. And that kind of weathering process will cause the rivers to carry certain elements because the rocks that are being weathered and you add tectonics, that will have the erosion side covered. And so the combination of oxidative weathering with erosion will lead to a supply of a suite of different kind of elements that's only possible if there's oxidative Mm -hmm. weathering. And Mm -hmm. that goes into our rivers and through the rivers it's going into our into our oceans Mm -hmm. but say if you change the chemistry of our atmosphere and suddenly made made it you could still have weathering 
but it's not oxidative weathering anymore. You will still weather and if there's tectonics, there'll still be erosion, but it'll be a very different suite of elements that'll be going into our oceans via our rivers. So what's in our oceans today is, is very much a function of what the the atmospheric redox chemistry is right, like. right, right, and that dictates what's being weathered. A very, very important part is what's being weathered. So you can have all the oxygen in the world, but if you're not weathering the right rock types, so certain elements that are really essential for life in our mm-hmm. oceans um, are usually concentrated in in mafic rocks. It's a certain kind of rock that contains a lot of these elements, like nickel, cobalt, um, selenium, molybdenum, etc. But if you weather rocks that are more more felsic, you won't have those elements. So you can still have the oxygen, mm-hmm, you can mm-hmm. still have the erosion. But if you're weathering, but like you said, Anthony, it's it's not. If I were to look at the Bay of Bengal sediments right now, so that's the erosion from the Himalayas into the Bay of Bengal versus I don't know the Great Australian Bight, where not much, much, not much erosion, <laughs> not much is going not on, much is going on. <laughs> so the chemistry is going to be very different. However. Overall speaking, the ocean chemistry is very different to what it might have been in the past, mm. which is what is my um, And is that different because we live in an atmosphere with the luxury of oxygen? Absolutely. <laughs> oxygen has had a huge role to play in the way that the chemistry of uh, oceans are today. Did I just hear you say that elements like cobalt, nickel, selenium are essential for life? in the oceans actually not just for life in the oceans for for you and me and as we speak by the way i'm deficient in cobalt so y- you can have, have you had <laughs> have you been tested <laughs> i have been you tested. have done your own analysis I in the lab i have been or? tested and guess what deficient i lack cobalt. deficient in cobalt uh, vitamin b12 is what i have to take oh, on a, cobalt. Yeah. on a on right. a regular basis but trace it's not just these trace elements like nickel, silly. It's not just important for life in the oceans. It's important for every single life form mm. on the planet. Mm. They are so fascinating, these bioessential trace elements or bioactive trace elements. Think about life, to sustain life under these sort of temperature pressure, which is conducive for life. So this is, a, you know, for instance, the temperature pressure in the room. But this temperature pressure is not enough to run the different chemical reactions yes. that basically run like clockwork to sustain life. It's the trace elements that act as catalysts and speed up those reactions 1,000 times to make sure you and I can survive as living entities under temperature pressure right now. I, this is crazy. I've never thought about this before. That's such a good analogy. So the the you know chemis- chemical reactions are in part all about Pressure, temperature, those kind of conditions. Exactly. And this pod booth is a lovely studio, but it's simply not good enough to naturally sort of help those chemi- essential chemical reactions for life along. Yeah, they, they'll be very sluggish. So these reactions, in order for them to run like clockwork and produce the results that we want, they have they need catalysts, and trace elements are one of the the absolute required ingredient for these for these reactions, they speed them up. There are other uh, benefits of trace elements as well. So so not just life in oceans, actually, life anyway. So you, you could have all the food you want, but if you're deficient or if you have too much of it, it could either get toxic mm-hmm. or, or you can be deficient. So it's like that critical concentration. Can't have too much of it. Wow. Can't have too little. And they come mostly from rocks that we call mafic, mafic rocks. They can be traced back to a type of rock. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, when you weather and erode, it's obviously when we're looking at weathering processes, it can't be selective weathering. But it's predominantly, if you have a pre- predominantly mafic uh, rock source, then yes, you tend to uh, introduce more of these elements, trace elements into the into the oceans and vice versa. And it's uh, it's basically the weathering and erosion on land. So that that's one uh, uh, dominant factor how these trace elements get into our oceans. However, there are processes that occur on the ocean floor. So there are some hydrothermal fluids that are being released from deep under the earth that could also introduce some of these critical trace elements into our oceans. However, the dominant uh, driver of introducing these trace elements into the into the marine realm 
is through the weathering and erosion of the rocks Amazing. on our lands. So one of the other things that, apart from your knowledge of current day oceans, you've had a lot of work that you've been doing on ancient oceans as well. And one of the things that has been really fascinating for me reading these papers that, and, and, and seeing some of your talks over time has been the old, whole, whole idea of that in Earth's history there's a period of time which geologists think <laughs> of as typically pretty boring. There's this idea that there is this boring billion is this sort of saying, right, between uh, sort of Earth's early period where lots of, lots of things seem to happen and then and not by much. early what age? Oh, like from the beginning from 4.6 to about 2.5 billion. Yeah, well, we had the origins like of life, so that must have been spectacular. <laughs> life, life, life had to start. It had to start in there. But, okay, so we can say that's spectacular. <laughs> and then from about, say, about, oh, about 520 million years ago till now, it, life has been spectacular, so we've been really interested we in that. We got fish. Oh, of we got course, fish. we got dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Oh, crazy about cockroaches. Dinosaurs. Oh, my God, I hate cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> Mosquitoes. So yeah, much. and, and my French cool bulldog. things. Crocodiles, you know, the great things. But there right? was something in between. And there's, there's, there's exactly. <laughs> there's this, so there's a, well, they call it the boring billion, but it's more than one billion. It's a, there's some a number of billions of years where apparently nothing happened. Is this a science fight? Do you think it's boring? That billion years. The pro, what we call the Proterozoic for people who know these names. But anyway, about two point yeah. five to about I don't know five. I'm currently years. creating a list of people who think that it's a boring game. <laughs> <billion, but laughs> they have some. <laughs> and their number is. <laughs> <laughs> their days are numbered. Congra- <laughs> Congratulations, number thirteen. <laughs> Cross. Um, unbelievable. It's you know what it's like. I've used this analogy before. I hope you like it. Please like it. Um, <laughs> I'm so scared. You know when someone's pregnant, they make a big deal about. The baby at the end, <laughs> but the nine months they're like, oh, it's so boring. It's no, so boring. what? That's when you lay the foundation. That's exactly right. And that's exactly what the boring billion, whoever came up with that name, honestly, I will never forgive them. <laughs> um, it is so unfortunate because it is that period in Earth's history where the foundations of complex life was laid without biological milestones Mm -hmm. that actually occurred during the boring billion, we would have no explosion of life forms, cockroaches, which probably isn't a bad thing, but dinosaurs (laughs) and and humans. Even the humans, yeah. Speaking of cockroaches. The the Taylor Swifts and the Freddie Mercury. We don't have (laughs) any of those. Seriously. So it's, it's, I use the pregnant woman analogy because Yes, it might seem nothing's happening for the nine months, but and everyone's making a big deal about the baby. But it's that those those nine months that are absolutely crucial towards any sort of explosion of life form. And I particularly have focused on the on the Proterozoic, as you mentioned, and and it really um, fascinated me thinking, well, knowing Earth and it's you know how dynamic Earth can be. How how come that nothing happened for a boring it's, billion years? It's, it's, un, it's, it's sort of it's uncharacteristic right? for Earth to have nothing happening. There's always something happening somewhere. Yeah, and certainly at, at at the scale of millions of years, some big things happen. You know, entire continents will move across the face <laughs> of the Earth. Yeah, you know, mountains will be uplifted and eroded. There's always something happening, and that certainly would have been happening even in the boring billion. Absolutely. And 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 I think geologists acknowledge that that happened, but one of the main reasons why they think it's boring is because of how well you just articulated that you had the origins of life mm. um, before the, the boring billion and after the boring billion you had explosions of life form. So you, that makes it look like, hang on. Um, yeah, you're basically, yeah. Something, but it's like, I don't know, you Origins of life, you conceive, then you get pregnant, and then you get. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> the baby. It's at the end. a very, very sequential uh, process that's happened, mm. and traditionally, like I said, it's the interaction of the seawater with the sediments, and the sediments capturing what the ocean chemistry was, and so you could target rocks. So we targeted rocks that were that specifically formed in the boring billion during the boring billion. Looked at data that was uh, published previously, tried to understand why they're calling it. And it was because they discovered, well, during the time, during the boring billion times, the oceans were 
deprived of these critical trace elements. Cobalt, selenium. A lot of them, yes. And and I thought, well, and geochemists have various ways of assessing, trying to understand what the trace element availability might have been like in past oceans. So everyone deployed their own techniques, so did we. Interestingly enough, my results are not, you know, it's not different from what's been published. It's the same thing. But I am interpreting the same data differently. So it's called boring because there's no, um, you know, the oceans are uh, devoid of these critical essential elements. Um, You don't see much happening and it's boring. Nothing happened. Whereas my way of interpreting this period is, yes, this is a, a very low bioessential trace element period in, in our oceans relative to the Archean mm. and after. And that sort of sort of trough, if you look at the you know trend of ocean chemistry through time, it's like a significant dip occurring over, uh, say, 1,800 million years to around 1,400, so quite significant. I think that was an absolute essential for evolution of life. And I say that because in the geoscience world, we are talking about life on Earth, blah, blah, blah. But biologists also talk about it. And the reason why any complex life on Earth occurs today is because of the birth of a very complex cell called the eukaryotic cell, 34 trillion of which you and I are made of as well. Without the origins of that complex cell, there would be no complex life on Earth, not a single one. And forget about the dinosaurs, the Taylor Swift, <laughs> and uh, the cockroaches. But at some point, two cells, and, um, and biologists have been discussing this for generations as to how two simple cells got together to form a, a much more complex mm. cell. And there are two main theories. One is two simple cells got together in a symbiotic relationship. so just, you know, where they mutually benefit from one another. But the other theory is that it's more uh, predatory in nature where one cell ingested the other cell. And that's how um, we started the formation of the first complex cell. Now, my point is, as a geologist, I'm trying to understand why such interactions would occur on the first place. Because these two cells that are merging for whatever reason, friendly or, or fighty, they are capable of living independently. That, there's no nothing forcing them to do that. What is that trigger? Mm, mm. And I think it's the lack of nutrients that put that pressure on them to come up with strategies to cope with that nutrient stressful time. And in the process, started the birth of the first complex cell and that eventually evolved into being more and more complex. So basically laying the foundations. You know, the tummy is getting bigger, bigger, bigger. That's exactly what was going on. Mm-hmm. That's how I view it. Mm. So there's absolutely nothing boring about it. Mm. So it was actually the stress of low nutrient levels in the oceans which helped to trigger life. Absolutely. The most important event. Evolution. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> to, to Pretty much. I, I think it is one of the most, I is mean, it, origins of life, of course, yes. Yeah, so is it part, it, it, it's our bias because when we look at, because these things are preserved in the fossil record. Like evolution is what we look at in the fossil record. So obviously when we see dinosaurs, we get excited because they're very clear to see. But when you're dealing with single-celled organisms, fossil record's not so interesting. <laughs> the fossil, but, uh, yes. Yeah, no, um, no. But with advent of, of new technology, we are discovering more and more information. So mm-hmm. to give you an example, I started my PhD in, in the Boring Billion in 2014. Mm. And it was known... Uh, that eukaryotic fossils um, of, you know, absolutely sure microfossils were found in that particular time period. But again, humans have this fascination with big things, right? And everything that's, you know, can be seen with the naked eye, you relate to it more. Mm. Anything that's microscopic, oh, small. It's It's uh, unimportant. But it's Mm, very, uh, very common out there for for everybody to underestimate the microbial world, even though they have dominated the Earth's biosphere since the beginning of Mm. time and they've 
dominate it today. I know we're three individuals here, but we've got more microbes in our body than the number of cells mm. in our bodies. Mm. Uh, so, My gut microbes are off balance at the moment. Absolutely. <laughs> they, they can literally make or break things, uh, the gut microbes. They, uh, so, <laughs> not to be taken lightly. But, <laughs> Boil your water. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but we underestimate them and we continue to underestimate them in deep time. <laughs> Absolutely. And But the, the good thing is that since 2014, like I was saying, till now we have uncovered so much information. And, you know, earlier there was this, oh, there may be this, there may be that. No, now, now there's like uh, concrete evidence mm. of these, uh, of the beginnings of the eukaryotic cell in uh, in the fossil record. So it's there, it's, it's just micro and it doesn't get the attention that a dinosaur Fossil. I mean, can you imagine the ABC going crazy on a dinosaur fossil being discovered? Oh, they would. And they would, a tiny microscope. Mm -hmm. Not just the ABC. We would all fall over ourselves too. You yeah, see, I wouldn't. <laughs> Not impressed. I get it. I think I'm starting to Controversial. see Controversial. the light here. <laughs> Maybe this is a higher order question. Why was the flux of these like critical nutrients into the ocean low during? That such a generalized statement. Why was it low during the billion years that we're talking about? But that's a fantastic uh, question. I, I, I it's, it goes back to what I was explaining before. A, a lot has to do with so that's the interconnections that we've discovered. It's not just me as, as geologists. We we love making these connections, and it's all to do with how the Earth was shaping up. So the beginnings of Earth, we had to first form our oceans, and we had to start with point A. And depending on what rocks, igneous processes were occurring at the time. So, for instance, in the Archean, we had a lot of ultramafics, lots of comadiades. So the co uh, continental crust composition was very different. Slowly, the plate tectonics started so this, to evolve. Can I just interrupt with it briefly? But just to explain a little bit about things like comadiades and mafics, what we're talking about there are rocks which originate from deep in the earth, from what we call the mantle. So when that very high in magnesium, very high in iron, these sort of rocks, in the early earth there was a lot of overturn because it was so hot. So a lot of these mantle rocks Bubbling were brought, up. exactly bubbled up to the surface and made them available to be weathered and eroded and into those primordial oceans. Exactly. And that was, you know, the start of building that repository of elements that were there. And that's what life had. You know, here, here you go, take it or leave it, and they took it. Mm. But when you've you've started the process of of plate tectonics and over time things change the geological environments change mm. what's being produced what's being subducted every the whole plate tectonics uh, dynamics change and that dictates what's available to be weathered and eroded and so during the boring billion not only did we have very low oxygen in the atmosphere we also had lots of Felsic magnetism, and so the the composition of the continental crust changed drastically. Mm. That's not to say that there weren't any mafic rocks. So when I say the critical elements were low, you can still detect them oh, in yeah, our rocks. Oh yeah, there's plenty of it's them. It's just there. relatively yeah. Relative, speaking, it, yeah. um, there it, it was the first time that the life in our oceans was subjected to that kind of pressure. Uh, the the processes operative on, on the continental uh, lands and, and atmosphere was strong enough to drive and completely change the nutrient flux, but the levels went drop. They were, so not all elements dropped at the same level. And that's another interesting thing. If, for instance, if uh, molybdenum drops too low, which other element is similar in, um, uh, uh, you know, behavior, chemical properties? Yeah. yeah and it's tungsten. And mm. So when one <laughs> trace element yeah. one trace element was unavailable, perhaps the organisms now had the opportunity to use another element which had similar properties but obviously slightly different. And then that, that added to the evolutionary processes as well because you're, it's like COVID when we... It's, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry to bring it. It's, it's still raw in our heads, isn't it? But the please way, explain. Yeah. Please explain, yeah. yeah. Oh, God, you make me sound like uh, Pauline Hanson. No, uh, no, no, no. That's, <laughs> I was being Pauline. <laughs> okay, well, uh, that, that's much better. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. so, no, 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 no. We really, I did not, I just had to make it political. Please cut this bit. No, <laughs> no girl. <laughs> so it's like with COVID, they're like, shut down, lock down, figure out. And businesses had to be like, well, we can't operate. Yes. And we have to find out some way. And obviously, some businesses 
incurred a lot of losses, but there were businesses who figured it out, came up with more creative solutions. And now they much rather prefer this newer model mm. um, than the pre-pandemic model. So it works in our benefits. Stress is good for us. I've got another one. So what could the Indian cricket team learn from the boring billion? Oh, is it too soon perhaps? <laughs> it is too soon, but I think, I think, I think you bring up a very good point, Holly. I think they weren't stressed enough. I think the Australian cricket team was subjected to that tre- stress throughout the tournament and they evolved to deal with it. Yeah, they showed the up. the Indian team, too comfortable, too comfortable. And uh, my God, did we pay the price? <laughs> I'll tell you what, that's one theory. That's one theory. I have another theory. Yes, yes. It could just be Adelaide. I've got uh, to, sorry? <laughs> you, I've got to when you come Adelaide. to Adelaide, the Indian cricket team lose. Is that, so when we have the, when 36 Have you come out the last 10 years every year? <laughs> whenever I come to Adelaide, something <laughs> terrible happens. <laughs> last time it was 36 all out when the Indian cricket team. Oh, I remember that. that. Yeah, that Adelaide. excellent. Adelaide, this bloody is true. Adelaide. This is true. And We've got to remember I next remember time to invite Indrani. Last time yeah. I was here, it was... Pissing down with rain mm-hmm. was awful weather. Yes. This time I come, my country loses. Mm. The other conspiracy theory is just me and Adelaide. It's just not. It's was, not meant to be. It's not working mm. enough. Well, maybe that, maybe that stress and the pressure of Adelaide is actually helping in the sense of causing, helping you to evolve. It's helping the Australians, a- damn right. Yeah. <laughs> India, I don't see India evolving. It's been a decade, buddy. <laughs> Mind you, that's nothing. It's nothing when you've got a billion years. Yeah, <laughs> true. So this is awesome. So we went from being judgy about we had life and then we had nothing and then we had fishies and humans. But actually that billion years was just quietly feeding, quietly creating stresses, quietly depriving the oceans of weird elements like cobalt, like selenium, et cetera, and it was stressing life out and those two cells looked at each other. What were so is this this theory of how complex cells came out? Those two cells looked at each other, went, we're a little bit stressed, we've got to adapt, there's no trace elements around. Yeah, cost of living pressures, so let's move in together. <laughs> <laughs> literally! It wasn't literally. love. It wasn't for love. It was, <laughs> it was for money. <laughs> Love's a luxury, Anthony. <laughs> but but I, will, I will make the point. For, for macro life to succeed the way it has, and by macro I mean, you know, uh, bigger, larger organisms, <laughs> for, for macro life to, to succeed the way it has on, on, on Earth today, the micro life had to be established. The sure. microbial world plays an in, incredibly important role. Even in ocean chemistry, ocean health, ocean life, 50% of our world's oxygen comes from our oceans. But it's not the water creating the oxygen, mm. it's, the, it's the microbes, the phytoplanktons that are in our oceans creating they are photosynthetic in nature and they are producing the oxygen that you and I rely on so much. So you're right, while while it may not have, you know, seen that much was happening, but the micro world was being established and that whole food chain process had to be established before any macro life could take off. So I, yeah, I, I don't think it, there's anything boring about that at all. I agree. You better. (laughs) (laughs) The white outfit at number 13 hasn't quite come out yet. (sighs) I've got one question, but it kind of hoops back to the beginning. So pardon me, I'm going to go on a little tangent. But did I hear correctly that the chemistry, like today, we talk about how the, the overall general chemistry of the ocean is a function of an oxygenated atmosphere. But that being said, there's little pockets of diversity where Bay of Bengal will be different from Australian Bight. That's wild. Is that because of the sediment that's being eroded from the neighbouring, from the nearby land? And why aren't they just, you know, oceans have waves and stuff. Why aren't they just mixing up and around the place? Uh, they, there is a lot of mixing and there's a lot of ocean circulation as well. That's something we can't actually comment on what happened in the past and what an important role because we're not quite sure how the ocean circulation worked as much. But today, uh, yeah, absolutely right. There, There is a lot of mixing going on in our oceans depending on how the the uh, not just the ocean circulation but you know a lot of the uh, wind there's a wind component as well and so of course there's a lot of uh, mixing and and that's why I said broadly speaking you could still classify what's happening right now uh, being very different 
I don't know, has been like this for, I don't know, at least a couple of thousands of years at least. And that would have been very different to say something like 3.5 billion years mm. ago. Mm. But uh, there's a, it just depends on the time scales because Earth system processes occur on a wide range of time scales. So depending on what we are looking at, because there'll be things that are changing from Monday to Friday or as mm. we speak or over thousands of years. So I think when we are comparing something with the past, we need to look at the more big picture uh, sort of more broad characteristics rather than, you know, honing it down to, I don't know what's happening in Bay of Bengal versus. Mm. So while there are these heterogeneities overall in the big scheme of things, it's uh, consistent. I can't believe I just described ocean circulation as oceans have waves and stuff. <laughs> wow. Well, Which is true. It's true. Yeah. That's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> so what else do you... What other weird stuff? What like what other oh, elements do you get in the ocean? Well, I was going to say, what else? Where does this? What other things are this? Yeah, yeah. What what other things? And partly the, there is actually an economic angle to this as well, right? You know, Absolutely. because some of our big ore deposits, well, many of our big ore deposits, especially in Australia, were deposited or formed. Bit of a debate there, formed or deposited, <laughs> but you know, in the boring billion. No, if, no, no, no. In the in that were... billion. In thank you. The... I really I'm not it. getting my you're name not... down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want to, you want to you're be not off on the list. list. You're not but you're, on the but list. you're right. So actually, this this billion years hosts. She's she's I know. Says, <laughs> she's the way she says that, I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> I actually am slightly worried now. Um. Yeah. So what's going on with ore deposits and oceans and that billion years? Yeah. So like I mentioned to you before, that the main driver of these elements into our oceans is our rivers. But there are processes that may occur on our ocean floors where there, there might be a hydrothermal or, or some sort of injection of really hot fluids from deep into, below. from deep below into mm-hmm. the seawater. Now, what happens is, whatever happens is, that's why we love rocks, right? Because they're like a, I don't know, they're like a time machine. They capture whatever is going around them. Mm. And so if... So what we found um, when we studied the rocks in the Boring Billion, that some rocks that are very good for understanding the ocean chemistry at any given time also happen to be very rich in mineral deposits. Mm. Uh, what sort of elements? Like? So we're looking at zinc and lead and, and silver. And we were wondering, well, why are these elements so, you know, enriched in these in these rocks why are these rocks that that enriched and we wanted to see if there's any pattern on same age rocks same location we're looking at very high concentrations of these economic minerals what happens if we go away from mm. from that particular site because we were trying to get the seawater chemistry but if something's happened there and it's uh, the whatever injection of hot fluids from deep underneath. If, if that's mucking our seawater chemistry, we don't want it. We don't yeah, want you, it. You, ironically, for a geologist in Australia, you were going to go away from the ore deposits. Absolutely. Yeah. And can you imagine? I was doing my PhD at the time at the Centre of Excellence for Ore Deposits, <laughs> and I, I'm trying to go away. Away from, from the. <laughs> and uh, I exactly. Normally, you'd want to know what's going on. We're like, oh, we don't want that. We want our. Uh, uh, boring uh, or or brilliant ocean, exactly, which is background also is extremely important for Mm. for industry as Mm. well. Mm. They need to know what the reference point is. Mm. So we wanted to move away. We were like, no, we want the barren parts of the the shale. We want to have nothing. But then it occurred to us, oh, hang on a second. How about we have a look at the chemistry of the rocks from close to the deposit, uh, basically varying distance from the deposit. So we have the very barren, barren shale where there's no economic minerals. And then we slowly analyze the rocks as we move closer to these uh, mineral deposits. And we saw that there is a very systematic trend in the way that it manifests itself in the in the rock record. And that information then becomes very valuable to industry because they can now use the geochemistry of the rocks as an exploration tool. Mm. So that's worked out uh, really well. So I have mainly focused on the the chemistry of pyrite and of course there are elements uh, for example zinc and lead as you go away uh, from the deposit it'll decrease but there are elements that as we move close to the deposit it increases uh, sorry decreases and so there are forget about zinc lead and silver there are elements that are associated with 
this hot fluid injection in the seawater and they can kind of tell you how close to the the dollar sign you <laughs> are basically and so that's worked out really well um so that's another very applied aspect of of geochemistry i'd say very that's applied been. yeah 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 that also helps you all your exploration programs and 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 you know look, linking to vector into yeah. an ore deposit yeah. very so there important. it is again there it is like understanding the magic of seawater in deep time Helps helps us source the world's silver, silver, yeah. lead, and zinc. Oh, Absolutely. don't you love it? Yeah. Uh, again, nothing boring about that. Some of the world's largest CEDEX uh, deposits or uh, zinc lead sedimentary zinc lead deposits were were formed during that time. So yeah, there's nothing uh, nothing boring about it at all, is there? I'm convinced. <laughs> Fine. I'll Not lie. only by the threats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I always was a drone. <laughs> This has been a pleasure. Thanks so much for coming on board with us today, Indrani. Thank you so much Thank for having you. me. Thank <laughs> you. Good to see you. Thanks.